Well, this is the second time I've tried to record this teaching because they see this candle right back here. It turns out that when you light candles underneath wooden shelves, they, they light the wooden shelves <laughs> on fire. <laughs> so anyway, here we go. Let's try this again. Happy first week of Advent, everyone. It didn't actually light the shelf on fire, but I started to smell something that was of concern. I hope your homes are filled with joy and Advent wreaths and all of the meaningful traditions that lead us to Christmas. Advent, for those of you that are new to the church, makes up the four Sundays before Christmas. Now, traditionally, it's a season of prayer and fasting as the church readies itself for the great Christmas feast. But in our tradition, it tends to focus on this weekly theme where each week we light a candle to commemorate those, those themes. Uh, the themes are hope and joy, peace and love. And this week you'll have light, likely just lit your hope candle. And if you need a little bit of help understanding the Advent wreath, you can watch the video. I'll try and link to it up here where I explain how an Advent wreath is set up. I do that with my wife, Julie. Well, for this first Sunday of Advent, the scripture assigned to us is Romans chapter 13, verse 11 to 14, which you just read. And if you were preparing for a quaint Christmas story, it may have struck you as a bit of a strange choice. You know, there's no angels or shepherds or frankincense or myrrh. There's not even any peppermint spice lattes mentioned anywhere or chocolate or Christmas trees. Just Paul talking about the day of the Lord and instructions then to not indulge in sinful behavior, but rather to clothe ourselves in Christ. You say, what's going on here? Why are we reading this passage on the first Sunday of Advent? Well, the answer in part comes when we remind ourselves what the word Advent actually means. It's Latin. It's a Latin word that means coming or appearing. And while our branch of the church tends to take this season to remember just that first coming of Jesus as a baby, the Advent season is actually a time when the church is to recall the coming of Jesus as a baby, and also his future coming as a triumphant king. And so this passage then anchors us in that second coming of Jesus and how we are called to live in light of this great future hope. So let's see if we can dig into a, a little bit together and, and make sense of what's being said here. Since the beginning of chapter 12, a chapter or so before, Paul has been dealing with matters of ethics how the followers of Christ in Rome are to live. Jesus, who came as a baby, we believe was also the fullness of God in human form, right? He was the human God, as we say. And his invitation to people, as we read in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, was that people would follow him. Jesus called people to follow him. He's still doing that. And in following him, his promise was that he would show people how to live in God's good kingdom so that they would begin to produce then the fruits of goodness and righteousness. And so as I say, from chapter 12 on, the Apostle Paul has been conveying to the reader what the fruit of this goodness and righteousness is going to look like. And in the section right before our passage, he reaches the high point reminding the Roman believers and you and I that the climax of our Christian action is love, right? That above all, as we follow Jesus, we are to be people of love, sacrificial love, laying down our lives love, love even toward our enemies as Jesus teaches us. But now, as we turn to our passage, he adds more. And he begins our passage by saying, and do this. In other words, along with loving your neighbor, along with all the rest of the things I've been speaking to you about, I also want you to do this. And as we read along, what he wants us to do is to be clear about the times in which we live. Because he seems to believe that being clear about this will have implications on how we are to conduct ourselves. And so to help us understand this, then he uses this wonderful imagery to invoke our imaginations. He tells us that the night is nearly over, that the day is almost here. And so we should wake up from our slumber, he says. We should come out of the darkness and begin to live in the light of the day. And what Paul means by this imagery is that with the first coming of Jesus, 
the light of God's love and goodness has broken into the world. And because of this, he goes on to say that the day is almost here and the salvation of God is almost here. And what he means by this is the return of Christ and the vanquishing of evil is nearer now, as he says, than on the day they first believed. It's one day closer. Every day for Paul is a day closer. Let's see if we can make sense of this a little bit more than maybe using an, a more recent analogy for us. In World War II, Sam and I just watched the story Band of Brothers, an amazing miniseries on television. But in World War II, historians look back now and see that the decisive moment of that war came actually on June 6, 1944, which we know as D-Day. This was the day that the Allied forces stormed the beaches of Normandy to gain this controlling and strategic foothold in France. And while the war didn't end until May of 1945, almost a full year later, in many ways, the war was actually won on D-Day. It was the day that made V-Day possible. The light of the Allied forces had stormed and overcome the very real darkness of Nazi Germany. The night wasn't over yet, but everyone knew that the day of liberation was almost here. And this is somewhat like what Paul is talking about here. With the coming of Christ and with his death and resurrection, the darkness of sin and Satan and death had been overcome. That's what scripture teaches us. This was our D-Day. But the war of evil continues to wage. Evil is still very much at work in our world. Darkness is still present. And it will be until V-Day, the day we believe that Christ will return to finally judge all sin and all evil. And so we live really in this in-between time. But as we do so, between D-Day of the first coming and V-Day of Christ's second coming, Paul urges us to come out of the deeds of darkness, to come out of that dark world, and to instead to live in the light. And he tells us that we are to live clothed in Christ, to live in the armor of his light, which he's just told us, above all means that we will be people who are desirous of love and good works, especially toward our neighbors. Because the victory of Christ has come, because the victory of Christ is coming, Paul says to us, don't live then in the deeds of that darkness. And he lists the, some of the examples out. It's not a full list of these things. He just gives some examples. He says carousing and drunkenness, and sexual immorality, and debauchery, and dissension, and jealousy. And instead, he says, we are to live as followers of Jesus, and to learn from him the way of light and love as we await the full liberation of creation from the powers of darkness. So let me ask you this really basic question then to start off with. Are you a follower of Jesus? Most of you will answer that question, well, yes, I am. Well, then what does that mean for you? How is Christ calling you to live and to be in this world then as you live between these two comings of Jesus? Are there areas of darkness where the Spirit is urging you to come out of those things? Well, what's stopping you? Maybe you need to confess these things and find forgiveness for them. Maybe some of the things that you're involved with, you need a friend to walk with you in, to hold you accountable. Or maybe there are matters that are much deeper in you and you need support. You need a spiritual director, you need a counselor, you need a therapist. Maybe there are addictions in your life that you need to be liberated from. It's okay. There doesn't need to be any guilt or any shame in any of these things. We are all, myself included, caught in a great battle with darkness. It's still present. And yet as we live in these times, we remember that the sun has almost call, come and we are being called to live now as we are in the day. And so maybe this Advent season is about an awakening for you, 
a time for you to step into a new way of being. And I want you to promise you that the Spirit and your church is with you in this journey. We're with each other in these things. I believe that God has great things in store for us in these days. I see a world around us that is filled with much pain and much confusion. I think you see that world too. And yet in the midst of these things, I also see the light of Christ calling people into a new way of being. And I'm praying for us. I want you to know that. I'm praying for you. Every day I'm praying for you. I'm praying that we might follow together as we live in the hope of this kingdom. And even so then, we say in this Advent season as we do all year long, come Lord Jesus, come. Lord bless you.